So uh, before I start, any questions uh, before we start today's lecture? Any questions about how the class is going, about how about your assignments or demos? All right, so if you have any question, just feel free to type it in or even unmute yourself and you can just ask the question if you want. When will we get details on the writing assignment? Uh, yes, so I'm gonna release that soon uh, in the next couple of days. Um, and you know, it's under preparation, okay? All right, any other questions? Okay, so let's get started. Uh, so uh, today we're gonna continue where we left off last time. We've talked about uh, the Unix file system. We talked about inodes, how inodes are structured and how uh, you can locate, you can do virtual block number to physical block number mappings using the inode data structure, okay? So now we're gonna go a little bit uh, further down into the, uh, into, into the file systems, into the storage system stack, and look at this layer called the file system cache. Um, we have earlier you know, looked at, um, uh, say, hardware caches, L1 cache, L2 cache. We talked about TLB, a translation lookaside buffer, which is also a cache. So these are all at hardware level. But when we're dealing with file systems, all the IO operations need to go, go down all the way to the disk. And, um, and, and the, if, if, if all the IO operations had to go down all the way to the disk, then this would take a lot of time. Both read and write operations would take a lot of time. So what we're um, looking at now in this picture is uh, something we had seen earlier that at the top most layer, there's a virtual file system which provides a uniform view of the file system for all the processes running on the system. Below that are the individual file system implementations. So in the second layer, uh, the file system implementation could be numerous. Uh, but, uh, but then it, it be, believe that we have this layer called the file system cache or the page cache. Uh, so the purpose of the file system cache is to uh, store certain data blocks that are usually on the disk. But then if you're going to use a particular data block very often, then it's useful to keep it in a special part of the memory called the file system cache. So every time a data is read from the disk, um, uh, which is the lowest layer in this picture, you, the, the data goes through the device driver and is handed over to the file system cache and that uh, that block of data is just stored in the file system cache for some time. So um, we'll see in the next slide how both read and write operations can be speeded up uh, when you use the file system cache. But the basic purpose of file system cache is to intercept both read and write operations and, um, and to make the performance of the file system faster than it would be if all the IO operations had to go all the way down to the disk, all right? So let's take a look at uh, how file system cache works. Now, uh, as you can see in this picture, uh, we, there are, we are basically showing two operations, read operations and write operations. Just like with memory, they're load and store with every file, with file system there, Primarily two operations you do on files, read and write. So first let, let's take a look at the read operation. So let's say you're accessing uh, a particular block uh, from your application, you issued a read operation to, to read some part of the file, which that part of the file resides in a particular block. So, uh, so as the read operation goes down to the file system cache, every read operation would first go to the file system cache. If the file system cache already has that page stored from a previous operation, that's a hit operation. So when you get a cache hit, then you would, uh, then the file system cache doesn't need to go down to the disk to fetch the data. It can immediately return the data from its own cache, right? Uh, but then 
If on the other hand, the read operation uh, from the file system results in a miss, meaning that the file system doesn't have that data, then the IO operation then further sent down to the disk through the device driver. And then from the disk, the data, uh, the data is read back. It is placed in the file system cache. And then the data is also returned back to the upper layers. So, um, so this is very similar to how a TLB miss in a TLB hit or a regular hardware level cache hit or miss would work. So, um, so the idea here is that if we have a good caching policy, um, usually these are some part of a least recently used caching policy, then uh, most of these IO operations would hit in the cache. So uh, we are hoping that maybe like 90, 95% of the time we are getting hits and occasionally like 5% of the time or so we are getting misses, right? So most of the IO operations, read operations would be serviced very quickly and a few misses would go to the disk for the first time and then subsequently reach to the same data blocks would be faster, okay? So that's the primary purpose of a file system cache. But there is also a secondary purpose, which is to make write operations faster. So how does that work? If you can see in the second picture here, the uh, file system issues a write operation on some data block. So the write operation uh, would first see if the data block is present in the file system cache. And if the block is present in the file system cache, then the writes would be committed uh, to the uh, copy in the file system cache. Uh, and, and then the, you would immediately return back to the uh, upper layer. So at a later time, uh, when, uh, whenever the file, the file system cache is flushing data out to the disk, then these dirty pages that are in the file system cache would be flushed to the disk. So the thing to note is that write operations are not synchronous, meaning that uh, the write operation does not immediately go to the disk. You first write the data to the file system cache, and then the dirty pages would be asynchronously written to the disk at a later time. So that way, whoever is doing the write operation, whoever is making the write system call from user space, they don't have to wait for the data to be flushed all the way to the disk, okay? So what that means is for a short amount of time, say for a few seconds, your data may be sitting in the cache, dirty data may be sitting in the cache and may not have been written to the disk yet. Okay. This is also a common reason why if you power off your computer without shutting it down properly, then your file system gets corrupted, right? Uh, I'm sure like most of us would have had some experience with this, you know, suddenly your, your computer was powered off and you lose your files, okay? What, what's the reason for that? The reason is that there may be some dirty data sitting in the file system cache. When you power off your computer, you lose the data from the cache because that cache is in the main memory. This file system cache is part of the main memory. Once you power it off, uh, you lose all the data in the main memory. So, so it is very important to shut down your machine carefully because part of the shutting down operation is to flush the cache contents to the disk. Normally it takes a few seconds, but uh, there may always be some dirty data sitting in the cache that may not be flushed to the disk. Okay, any questions so far? Is this clear? So let me summarize this one more time. So the purpose of a file system cache is to speed up both read and write operations. Read operations, would first look in the file system cache. If you find the data there, then it's a hit and you can return the data to the upper layers immediately. If it's not there, it's a miss and you have to fetch the data from the disk and that takes longer. Write operations are first buffered in the file system cache and then they are flushed to the disk asynchronously at a later time, okay? So there is a claim at the bottom of the slide that's made here that if the cache works well, if the file system cache works well, then most of the IO accesses to the physical disk will be write operations, okay? So here's our physical disk. 
and here are like read operations and here are some write operations through evictions, right? So the claim here is that if the cache works well, and if you look at this layer between the file system cache and the disk, if you observe the IO operations going to the disk, you will notice that most of these IO operations are write operations, okay? Which is kind of interesting and it will have interesting implications later. Now, uh, I just want you to think for a moment why this would be the case. Why would we see mostly write operations here between the file system cache and the disk? Like disk is most, the claim here is the disk is mostly handling write operations. Why would that be? And you know, you could, um, Sir. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I guess because uh, if the like, uh, cache works well, then most of the data blocks will be hit. And we don't need disk as uh, uh, disk uh, access for the read operation if it is a hit. Uh, only need it for the. Okay. And, and how about write operations? Because writes are also being buffered, right? Right. So. So uh, for write operations, uh, at at uh, like uh, we need this uh, um, access uh, asynchronously. So yeah, like yeah, so, it is only for the writes. So okay. Yep. Anyone else? And that's a good answer. You know, anyone else wants to add to that? Okay, so uh, yeah, if if you are not able to hear that, you know, uh, the if if most of the I operations, for, for, let's say there is a user space application on top of the file system, uh, and then most of the um, I O operations, the I O operations coming from user space could be a mix of reads and writes. Okay, so we can't assume whether there'll be reads more or writes more in from the user space applications. Depending on what the application is doing, it may be generating reads or writes uh, in different quantities, okay? But then all these IO accesses are filtered through the file system cache. What that means is uh, if, they, if most IO operations uh, uh, follow the principle of locality, uh, which is important for caches, uh, then, the, then most of the read operations would be filtered out by the cache. So even though you may be getting like 50, 50 reads and writes, but uh, say 95% of the reads would be filtered out, okay? So very few reads uh, would actually go down to the disk. Now for write operations, uh, they would be buffered for some time as we just discussed, but uh, writes ultimately have to be flushed to the disk. Every write operation has to end up on the disk. Uh, that's the basic property of persistence, right? Uh, otherwise, our, we, we will end up with a corrupted file system. So, uh, so, so what, at most what you can do in the file system cache is you can combine a bunch of write operations and, and, uh, and batch them together. So you might have say, there are 10 write operations that go to the same data block, but after some after a few seconds, you have to flush it down to the disk for the sake of persistence, for consistency. So even though uh, writes are also being buffered and bashed, but still the, every write has to finally make it to the disk. So as a result, you will see a significant number of write operations, significantly more write operations than read operations on the disk. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions on this? Hi, Professor, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, about how large is the uh, cache? Like what percentage of main memory would be reserved for this? Uh, it depends, uh, you know, like in Linux, for example, if you just set up like a plain vanilla Linux, you would just boot it up. Um, and then about, I've observed that about like, you know, 200 to 300 megabytes of it could, would be, just allocated off the bat to uh, for the file system cache. Of course, it's a function of how much main memory you have. 
uh, but you know, it, typically seeing 200 to 300 megabytes in the file system cache is very normal. And as you do more IO operations, the size of the cache may also grow. Okay, so it's dynamic as well? Yeah, it's dynamic as well. So, um, but yeah, but, but usually certain of, portion of the memory is set aside. Uh, of course, this could also be free memory. It's hard to tell. There are certain statistics that Linux kernel provides through the slash proc file system. And, you know, um, I don't remember these at the top of my head, but yeah, I think if you say slash proc slash mem info, and it will tell you, you know, how much memory is allocated, how much is free, how much are for buffers and, you know, various breakup. Um, so if you just do cat slash proc slash mem info, uh, that would give you uh, some idea of how much memory is being used for the cache. But th it, thank you. It, all right. Um, and as a, as a follow up, you said um, that this is very similar to the way that the TLB works. I'm wondering if like uh, this cache scheme is also like, for instance, in internet browsers, does it work a lot the same way? Um, the same way? No, 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 no. I, I didn't mean like the, the way file system cache buffering and all work. I just meant the principle of, you know, hits and misses. Okay. Uh, all right. And, and yeah, there, there's probably similarity in, in, you know, write buffering versus write through caches and all that. Uh, but, but that's where the similarity ends. This is the main memory cache. Those are hardware caches. And they're very different. TLB particularly has very different function. So okay. sorry if that was confusing. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. Okay. So there's a question from Shengdong. Does user space caching of IO libraries like Filestar, um, what does it say here? Let me see. F read if right affect the behavior of kernel caching. Um, so the question is that in user space, IO libraries might do their own caching and does it affect the behavior of kernel caching? So I, um, I don't know, like my intuition is, of course, you know, they don't talk to each other. Like kernel does its own caching and it does not care what user space IO libraries do. Um, of course, you, it would be kind of redundant if your libraries are doing their own caching and the kernel is doing its own caching of the same data, and then you have to maintaining two copies. So, but as far as I know, they, they don't do any, there's no coordination between these. Kernel doesn't even know what libraries are there between itself and the user space application. So, so they're pretty much independent and it's possible they might end up doing some you know, redundant caching, which is probably bad. <laughs> okay. Gaurav has a question. Uh, you want to ask Gaurav? You can unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, professor, in uh, newer technologies, like where you have an SSD, which has an internal cache of its own. So does the system sort of know that there is an internal cache and it writes again through that, to that cache or something, or is it just handled by the driver of the SSD? Okay, so that's an interesting question. Um, okay, so so what? Uh, let me just rephrase Gaurav's question here, uh, which is that you know, let me see if I can do some annotation here, uh, and I hope you guys can see this. Um, let me see. <laughs> okay, so all right, so I'm going to use this little rectangle here. So inside the disk, uh, what Gaurav is saying is inside the disk these days, and not just in SSDs, but even the older magnetic hard drives, they would have like a little cache, all right? And uh, let me just write a disk cache, okay? And, uh, and what happens is these disk, if, especially if it's a magnetic hard drive where there's spinning disk and there's rotational and seek latency involved in accessing the disk. So many of these disk caches, you know, they would first go look for the data in the disk cache, which is like a small, um, small piece of RAM. It could be uh, DRAM, Dyna, which DRAM, or it could sometimes be NVRAM, okay, non-volatile RAM. And 
the idea is that if you go first look in the disk cache, and then if you miss here, then you go and access it from the physical disk media. So that it, so, so that kind of saves a lot of IO latency. Likewise, write operations first go to the disk cache, and then from there, the disk's firmware would commit it to its physical media. So these disk caches, because they are onboard on the disk, they can't be very big. They're usually very small, okay? So, um, and uh, it's, uh, and their primary purpose is <clears throat> uh, to buffer write IO operations that are coming in so that the disk controller can acknowledge uh, the completion of the IO operation uh, to, the, uh, to the upper layers, okay? For read operations, I mean, you can't cache a lot in here. These are, these, at least a few years ago, these used to be typically a few megabytes, a few tens of megabytes, so it's not a lot. Um, and of course they tend to, especially if it's NVRAM, they tend to be expensive, right? So um, like some magnetic disks used to have solid state memory as a disk cache, um, and now SSDs, uh, probably have DRAM as a cache. Okay, so, but this, the size is not very large. So it's, um, it, it's not necessary. It, it, you still need a file system cache because file system cache can be very large. It, it like I mentioned, few hundred megabytes onwards and so forth. Okay, so, so it doesn't eliminate the need for file system cache. Plus you can have more sophisticated caching and eviction algorithms inside the OS, whereas in the firmware, you can only implement very simple schemes, okay? Um, yeah, all right. So there is another question from Shubham. Can we configure the system for more cache for improving performance? Um, I haven't tried. I, uh, I don't remember seeing something like that, but I could be wrong. Okay, so there, there may very well be some parameter that say set aside so much memory for cache, uh, but but I don't remember seeing anything of that sort. Okay, so and Singdung has another comment about glibc and lib stdc plus um, plus. Just so smaller buffer size greatly slows down the performance of I/O on some platforms. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's that's possible. So certainly you want the buffer size to be large enough because otherwise it becomes a bottleneck, right? I mean, if all the right operations are going to the buffer, and buffer has to be flushed fast enough to the disk in order to uh, get the appropriate performance. Okay, so so yeah, you don't want it to be too small, but you can't have too much either because memory is also expensive. Okay, all right, so, um, so let's move further, all great questions. So the, in this picture, you know, we're just showing how an internal um, data structures of a file system cache may look like. Uh, so if, as we know, file system cache has two purposes. One is to service read and write IO operations, that is, to, to check if read operations can be satisfied immediately and if the write operations can be buffered. But then the other purpose is also to keep track of the most, fre most frequently used data blocks in the main memory, okay? So uh, what that means is that if your memory is getting full, you need to evict certain pages, right? Or if you want to bring in a new pages, you want to kick out old pages. So uh, for lookup operation, the most uh, fastest way is to use a hash table, which is, if you re remember from algorithms, how hash tables work, you just compute a hash value on a key, uh, or let's say the block number uh, or the inode number, and then you, you access the corresponding data block. If, if you get a hit, then you will get a, the data block. If you get a miss, then you can go to the disk, all right? Um, and then you could you would see that uh, there are also secondary pointers for collision. So if two blocks belong to the same uh, hash bucket, then there are pointers that that represent the uh, 
represent the chain, uh, chain in the hash bucket, the colliding entries in the hash bucket. So, uh, so that's for the lookup operation. And then you would see there is a doubly linked list of data blocks, the same data blocks in memory, they are set aside, set together as doubly linked list. And uh, the tail of the doubly linked list is the most recently used pages, which means these pages were recently accessed uh, or used by some applications. Whereas the other end, the front is the least recently used or LRU. What this means is that when there is memory pressure in the system, you want to free up some memory, you would go to the front of this LRU queue and start evicting pages from here, okay? Um, and there are various variants of this page eviction algorithm. We briefly mentioned them earlier. Sometimes before you evict the page to disk, you see whether the page has been accessed recently and then you move it back to the front to give it a second chance. There's some, something called a second chance page replacement algorithm. So we won't go into the details of all those, but just suffice to know that uh, you know, this looks complicated, but it's really very simple. There's a hash table, a standard hash table, uh, and then superimposed on top of that is a doubly linked list. So, um, and, and both of these data structures have two separate purposes. One is to service the read and write operations, and the other is to keep track of most frequently accessed pages and to evict them as needed, okay? So, and when doing eviction, you check whether the block uh, being evicted is dirty. Dirty meaning whether it has been updated. If it is updated, if it is dirty, then you have to write it to the disk. But if it is not dirty, means it hasn't changed since it came in last time, then you can just reuse that page. You can just take it off the linked list and then reuse for some other memory allocation operation. Okay, any questions on that? All right. So, uh, so there is a connection between the file system cache and the virtual memory uh, page cache that we saw. So if you remember uh, earlier when we talked about virtual memory, memory was divided into pages. So when a process starts, its entire virtual address space is divided into pages. And as the, as the process accesses more and more uh, memory, then uh, it gets allocated more pages, right? Uh, but then if it doesn't use some, uh, there's memory pressure, its pages can be kicked out, which is very similar to what we just saw with the file system cache, right? In fact, the basic operation of a file system cache and a virtual memory page cache is almost identical. In Linux, actually virtual memory page cache and file system cache are one and the same. This is called a unified cache. Um, and, and of course, file system has certain additional uh, uh, caches like inode cache and so on, where you don't just cache data blocks, you also cache inodes for reuse. Uh, but, uh, but down at the lowest level, everything is memory. And, and if you're gonna maintain a cache and maintain the least recently used or most recently used pages, it's just worth maintaining everything as one uh, one single unified cache that you can use for both virtual memory operations and for file system operations, okay? So, um, and there's one more bullet mentioned here, uh, which, is, uh, which is an interesting point that, you know, if you, if you notice here, uh, going back to the previous slide, that there, there is, a, all these uh, blocks, they are organized together in a doubly linked list, right? So if the page replacement uh, uh, daemon or page replacement server wants to kick pages out, then it would have to acquire a lock on the entire doubly linked list. Remember, like our discussion of concurrency and race conditions. So whenever we are modifying a shared resource, we have to enforce mutual exclusion, you have to acquire a lock. So in this case, this entire doubly linked list is a shared resource, right? So, um, so the eviction algorithm may remove pages. At the same time, the lookup algorithm 
might want to insert pages into this cache, right? Or it might want to update uh, a, a certain, like if it's a write operation, you know, you want to, uh, of course, you know, write operation by itself doesn't need to acquire a lock, but, uh, but then let's say you want to move uh, one of these blocks to the front of the, to the rear of the queue, okay? Because it's been accessed recently. So, so there may be different components of the file system cache that are operating on this data structure concurrently. But this can really slow down the main, uh, the main purpose, which is to service read and write operations faster, right? So, uh, it's, it's, uh, because every time, you know, you, the eviction algorithm or whatever algorithm updates the LRU list, it has to acquire a lock and release a lock. And in the meantime, the lookup operations may have to wait. So in order to prevent that, what uh, Linux does in particular is that um, it, it maintains two lists, active list and inactive list, all right? So uh, instead of maintaining one linked list, it maintains two lists of linked lists of pages. One of the link lists is active and another is inactive, meaning that the pages in the active list are being actively used, whereas the pages in the inactive list haven't been used for a while. So that way, you're kind of breaking down the granularity of locking. Uh, so if the eviction algorithm will usually go and pick pages from the inactive list, they're less likely to be, act to be used, whereas the one in the active list are being actively used, and that's where the lookup algorithm will go and look first. And if some page in the active list isn't used for a while, they will be moved to the inactive list. So that way you can reduce the lock contention and make things a bit faster. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So finally, this brings us to uh, an interesting, interesting design of file systems called the log structured file systems. So what does this mean? It goes back to our original observation, which is this uh, claim in the slide that uh, if the cache works well, then most of the IO accesses to the disk will be writes, okay? So remember, especially the older magnetic hard drives, uh, their every IO access uh, involves seek and rotational latency. You have disks that are spinning, so, and, and then you have disk heads that are moving across various sectors. So there is a seek latency and there is a rotational latency, right? So file systems for several decades, the file systems were uh, based on uh, design to, to, to minimize the seek and rotational latencies, all right? So uh, if every block on the disk had a specific location on the disk, then every block in a file had a separate specific location on the disk, then you, based on the block being read, you'd have to seek to the corresponding sector or track and then rotate to the corresponding sector and then read the block or write to that block, okay? This, was, this is a huge disadvantage for write intensive applications. But then now we know from the behavior of a file system cache that most of the I operations going to disk are write operations. Okay. And we are writing at the granularity of entire blocks. We don't write like one byte or two bytes. When an IO operation goes down to the disk, when a write operation goes to the disk, it writes the whole block, okay? It overwrites the whole block. So some people said, all right, you know, what is the purpose of seeking and, and rotating to a particular sector and track only to overwrite the entire block? Because it doesn't matter where the block is, we just, we just, care about the contents, okay? So that's where this idea of a log structured file system came in, which means that if you're going to do a write operation on the disk, you just forget about its previous location of that data block. You just find the closest free space on the disk, free block, and then write it there, okay? So if you do this, basically, Every time you do a write operation, it's written to a new location on the disk, new free location on the disk. That way you can greatly reduce your seek and rotational latency. So um, 
so by doing this, you know, since most of the write operations going to the disk are, uh, most of the IO operations going to the disk are writes, most of the time you would write to whatever is the free location immediately, right? So for, uh, so, you, so you have eliminated most of the seek and rotational latency in IO operations. So this is like a very counterintuitive, but you know, very insightful uh, uh, observation, uh, which which has uh, greatly you know revolutionized the design of file systems. And pretty much most modern file systems that we use, like ext4 for example, partly borrows this idea. What, what this means is treating the entire disk as a log. By log, we don't mean like a wooden log or something. <laughs> log means like a log of events, right? Every I/O operation is like an event, especially write operations. So whenever you're maintaining a log of events, you you always write to the end of the log, and you don't go back and update an existing event. Once something is written to the log, it's it's permanent, right? And then if if there's an update, you write a new entry at the bottom of the log. So Likewise, you just treat the entire disk as a log. So why is that useful? Because uh, these days disks are getting very large. So uh, you can easily buy like terabytes uh, worth of disk. And what that means is that you can keep, you almost have unlimited space. So you can always find extra space on the disk where you can write your new data. And whenever you write new data at a new location, you forget the old uh, version of that data. And somewhere you mark it saying that the latest version of this block is located at this particular location. So, so this, um, uh, this way you, you can pretty much uh, write to the disks at, at the speed of sequential throughput, uh, which means that you know, without having to do any seek operations, you basically, uh, if you have a lot of write IO operations coming back to back, you can uh, write at the peak throughput of the disk. Usually magnetic disk, especially sequential throughput would far exceed random uh, IO throughput. Um, so, th so this is like the pure version of log structured file system. Uh, but then some people observed that, you know, you don't have to necessarily convert everything into a log, not all right IO operations, but actually most of the IO operations going to the disk are updates to the metadata, updates to the inode. Like you're changing the uh, properties, you know, updating the timestamp uh, or updating the block locations. So inode updates, metadata updates are more frequent, the, uh, even more frequent than the actual updates to the disk contents. So as a result, for example, ext4 is a journaling file system. What it does is it treats the metadata as a log, uh, meaning the updates to inodes and such are treated as a log but then the data itself is updated in place, uh, like in the old file systems, all right? So it's kind of a hybrid between a log structured file system and in place. Metadata is treated as log structure and data is treated in place, okay? Any, does this make sense? Any questions so far? There is actually one question I'm hoping somebody would ask. Uh, so, all right, so if, um, all right, so if nobody else is asking that, I would point this out. So I would ask you then, who it is that, you know, I just said that you always write to the next free space on the disk. So if you have written something earlier, you have to update it. No, you just find the next free block and write it to the end to the end of the log. What that means is over time, your log will keep growing, right? So, and if the log keeps growing, at some point you're gonna run out of disk space. Right? It may take a long time if you have a big disk, but finally you're gonna run out of disk space. So what are we gonna do? You know, it's more likely to run out of disk space if you're treating it as a log than if you were treating it as an in-place file system. So can anyone think of a solution to that?
you see that's a disadvantage of online class because i can't look at your faces so <laughs> so what wrote another layer of abstraction <laughs> oh that's uh, very creative make the previously written entry as inactive okay so meaning uh, by inactive as you, you mean like free it up right okay and then re-indexing the log okay uh, all right so and then create a particular memory allocated to it and clear it after it's full okay delete those file entries from log that have been deleted by the os <laughs> all right log eviction lru okay you could do some kind of a log eviction okay so um yeah so, so you're all pointing to uh a common theme which is you have to go clean up right if we leave behind a mess we have to go clean it up right so uh, and you don't have to clean up right away just like in java if you have used java and if you're familiar with how java jvm works you know there's garbage collection you must have heard of the garbage collection the term right in java you don't have to free memory you can just you know stop using the object there are no references garbage collector will pick it up so likewise for a log structured file system if your log grows too big periodically you can uh, go and clean up the old entries and and free them up so that when you reach the end of the disk you can wrap around and start from the beginning again using up those free entries so periodically you have to go and clean up the log um, and uh, what that means is like freeing up the older versions of the uh, of the data all right so and and if you can do it faster uh, periodically enough so that you know there's always some free space left on the disk it's not a problem okay does it make sense any questions all right so um, there is like a quiz at the end uh, just like we had some for uh, page tables like here uh, based on the inode um, structure that we discussed in the earlier class you're given a bunch of parameters um, and you know the disk block size and you know how many direct block addresses are there how many single indirect double indirect triple indirect and so on so based on this information you're asked to calculate you know what's the size of the file that can be accessed through various levels so what's the size of the file through direct block entries through single indirect and so on right and then you can also try to calculate if you're given a file size then how big is the inode like inode is also not free right inode actually sits on the disk if it was not clear earlier, I know it is a data structure, but it sits on the disk just like other blocks. So, uh, so for large files, I know it can also grow very large. Right? So, um, and another observation is that the structure of the I node, Unix I node that we saw earlier, that's meant that's designed for in-place file systems, right? With you know, for for file system where the data blocks have fixed location, right? But for log structured file system, you know, you can kind of do this, this mental exercise. How would your inode look like? How would you keep track of the current location of data blocks, right? And if you were to use a traditional Unix inode structure, what would it take to, uh, in terms of updating the inode? Because every write operation would change the location of the data blocks, so you have to go and update the inode. Right. So there are some interesting problems there, and, and I'm going to leave you there to think about those uh, instead of discussing right now. All right. So I hope everyone is able to see these slides. All right. Um, so we're going to switch. Um, we're going to still stay on storage system, but we're going to look at a lower level of the storage system 
uh, called redundant array of inexpensive disks or RAID. Uh, and uh, this is further down, even below the file system cache. Now we are looking at the storage layer and we're gonna look at how you can virtualize uh, the, 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 the physical storage media, particularly if you have many disks, how you can make them look like one physical disk with better reliability properties, okay? Or better throughput properties, better parallelism. Uh, and we will discuss the motivation for RAID, a little bit of history, and then we will uh, go deeper into the uh, details. All right. So as you can see, this picture here, uh, there is. A, this is like a sing, uh, one of the earliest hard disks uh, from IBM Ramdac computer, one of their mainframe systems. Uh, so this was. Uh, as you can see, it's you need a. It was huge. Uh, it needed a forklift to load into an airplane, and you can, uh, you know, it's, it must, you can, and they're using an airplane to ship it. And you, know, you can probably imagine it must be expensive, right? It would cost a fortune. And what did it have? Like it had five million seven-bit characters, so a grand total of five megabytes of memory, that's a seven bits, not even eight bits, right? And then it's a five MB disk, which had um, 50 platters, it was a rotating head disk. Uh, each of them were two feet large, okay? So, and there was all that other electronics around it. So the, each access time for the disk was, you know, less than a second. So if you performed a read or a write operation, it would, be less than a second, which was awesome at that time in 1956. Of course, now this is terrible, right? Uh, these just, you know, with SSDs, you can get microsecond access times with magnetic disks, you know, less than 10, 10 or five millisecond access time is very common. So, uh, but anyway, uh, to the point that the reason for showing this picture is that those disks used to be large, uh, but then, and then five megabytes was back then a lot of capacity, right? So, and because they were large and expensive, they were also meant to be reliable. You don't want to spend millions of dollars buying these and then it crashes, okay? So, there's a lot of engineering effort would go in to make them very reliable, okay? So, but because they were large and expensive and engineered very carefully to be reliable. Um, it's a, so only a few people can afford them and uh, only like people who have expensive maintenance systems could afford them. But then in 1980s, you started having, you know, personal computing revolution and, uh, and suddenly you can't have these expensive hard disks sitting on people's desktops, right? You needed cheaper hard disks. So, so how do you make something cheaper? You know, the obvious answer, first place to look is to reduce the quality, okay? Of course, there's engineering effort to shrink the hard disk, but then also like, you don't probably want, if somebody is not paying you so much money, you know, you're probably not gonna make such a reliable system for them. So, um, so, so as the reliability of individual disks when it started going down, um, you know, the people started, but then these disks became very cheap. So now you could buy a bunch of these disks and taken together, their capacity would be similar to one large disk. And people thought, well, why don't we stack a bunch of these together and make them look like a single disk, okay? So you want to replace large expensive mainframe hard drives with several what's called Winchester at the time, you know, uh, with several small cheap disks, okay? So, but there is a problem, which is that reliability wise, you're going to make things worse. So for every hardware device or, or in any complex system that you develop as engineers, you'd be asked to, you know, to, to specify what's the mean time to failure or MTTF. So what that means is you, know, you do a bunch of tests on it and then you predict that you know, this 
average mean time to failure for this disk is like 30,000 hours, let's say, okay? So you'll, if you run it for, if you buy a bunch of these, then you would see one disk failing every 30,000 hours. Um, of course, 30,000 is just a number, okay? You can have different numbers for different. So if you, have, if you design something to have larger mean time to failure, it will be more expensive. It has less mean time to failure, then it will be cheaper, okay? So if you take like N disks, let's say 100 disks, all right, which each of them has 30,000 hours mean time to failure, okay? But if you combine them together into one system and now you sell that, what is the mean time to failure of the whole system taken together, all right? A 100 disk system, let's say. So it turns out the mean time to failure for 100 disk system would be 30,000 divided by N or 100. In this case, that would be 300 hours. What that means is, you know, if the failure distribution is uniform, if failure probability is uniformly distributed, then uh, you, you would have one disk failing every 300 hours, which is not very nice because even if one disk fails in your 100 disk system, the entire system is useless because everything is being projected to be one disk. Okay, so the larger the n, the lower the mean time to failure. Okay, so so although now you have a high capacity system, but that's similar to the high large capacity mainframe drives, but the overall reliability of this large capacity system is actually lower than a single large disk. Okay. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? All right. So, uh, so some people, uh, some researchers at Berkeley, Randy Katz, David Anderson, I believe, they said, all right, we're gonna solve this problem because it's really interesting. We, how can we make these systems as reliable as the original disks, uh, even though without any do, doing anything special, their reliability will be worse, but we want to make them more reliable, okay? Uh, so, so that was the original motivation, but there is also another big advantage that you get, which is that let's say that you have, uh, let's say 10 disks or 100 disks, and what that means is that now, and you're treating them as one disk, but what that means is you can issue multiple IO requests in parallel. Earlier, if you had one large single disk, you can, you can only do one IO operation at a time. But with many disks, you can do multiple IO operations. With 10 disks, you can do 10 IO operations at the same time in parallel. Right, with 100 disks, you can do 100 IO operations in parallel. So, uh, so, so this gives you, um, uh, several factor scale in, in terms of uh, the disk throughput, throughput meaning number of disk IO operations per second that you can do. So, uh, so, so today, you know, disks are cheap, each single disk can have a lot of capacity, but then throughput is still a big concern, both for uh, original old magnetic drives and for new solid state drives. So, so big reason for that people use RAID today is to improve the disk throughput to get faster speed up, okay? Uh, but reliability is still a concern, right? So, so you still want the this entire system to be as reliable, but, uh, but we are not, instead of focusing on capacity, we are now focusing on throughput and parallelism, okay? So let's go back to our you know, understanding of how file system and storage system work together. In this picture, you see that there is the file system uh, at the top uh, that we talked about earlier. And then it uh, talks to device drivers, which provide something called a block device interface. Okay, so what does that mean? So the under, underlying disk can be of various types. It could be a hard disk, or it could be a solid state drive, or, or a CD-ROM drive, you know, or a network mounted drive, doesn't matter what it is, right? Um, everything looks to the file system, all disk underneath looks like a logical block device. What that means is uh, that 
you know, you start from block number zero, block number one, and so on all the way. So it looks like an array of blocks. Okay, so all IO operations happen at block granularity. This block can be like four kilobytes or eight kilobytes, whatever you configure it to be. So four kilobytes is usually the default. Um, so whenever you read or write, you say read or perform read or write operations on a particular block uh, and you give the index of the block. So it's like accessing, indexing into an array to access a particular element, okay? So underneath several layers of software or firmware would take this logical block mapping and convert them to physical block mapping. So, uh, so here I'm showing like uh, three separate disks, and uh, but then let's say you, even if you had just one separate disk, you would still need to do logical to physical uh, block mapping. So here, this mapping basically says, in the case of multiple disks, for every logical block, which disk does this belong to, and which uh, block within the disk does this belong to, okay? And there may be further mappings at the physical media level to say which sector, which track, and so on. So, so there's a logical I.O. space, there's a physical I.O. space, okay? Just like there is virtual memory and there is physical memory. So likewise, there's logical to physical memory mapping, okay? So, so we're going to look at basically what RAID is doing is performing this logical to physical IO mapping. Uh, it's taking a single logical IO space and mapping it into multiple physical uh, IO spaces. Okay, any questions so far? All right. So, uh, so this is the kind of high level overview of different types of RAID systems uh, and what uh, and we will go into the details of each of them but as you can see uh, there are uh, at least you know in the original paper that proposed RAID uh, they proposed like five RAID systems and uh, five RAID levels depending upon uh, the various reliability and throughput uh, guarantees that they provide and then uh, from then onwards, like people have developed more RAID levels, like there's RAID 6, RAID 10, and so on. So um, the commercially, you can get higher RAID levels too now. So most enterprise systems would possibly use higher RAID levels. Um, so we'll start from the, uh, from the earlier RAID, from the lower RAID levels and gradually move on to the higher ones, okay? Uh, and we'll see what are the trade-offs along the way. Okay, so let's start with RAID 0, okay? RAID 0 says that, um, says that it's not gonna make the zero there means like there's zero reliability, okay? So which means that you know, it's not gonna provide any additional reliability over what a collection of disk drives can give you. So, um, so what it does is it takes your data uh, from the logical IO space and it stripes it, it spreads it across all the physical disks that are part of the RAID array. So here we have four disks, disk zero, disk one, disk two, and disk three. And uh, in the logical IO space, if you put them in a straight line in an array, you have block zero, block one, block two, block three, block four, and so on. But we stripe blocks zero, one, two, and three uh, for, across the four disks. And then once we reach block four, we would go put block four on disk zero, then five, six, seven, and so on uh, uh, further down, all right? So, so as you can see, we're just wrapping around. Uh, 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 the logical blocks are wrapped around uh, the, on the physical disks. So this is very simple, right? And and what this means is that you know at any time you can be performing because you have four different disks so you could be performing four io operations at the same time okay so i could be reading from block zero writing to block one you know reading from block six or whatever combination you want so maximum four io operations at a time so the throughput is four times as much as a single disk okay now uh that's great 
you know so the more discs you add the more throughput you get but you would notice though that you know the fa from failure point of view there's no fault tolerance what that means is um, whenever we talk about fault tolerance we have to say what kind of faults are we trying to recover from so fault tolerance means that if something fails the system can still recover from that failure and could get back to a state where it can start servicing uh, uh, the requests, IO requests. So here, if you notice, even if any single disk fails, let's say that, you know, take any disk, disk two, let's say it fails, okay, crashes or stops working. So we basically lost all these blocks, block two, six, 10 and 14. So without these blocks, the rest of the data and the other disks are useless right because you know we might have lost parts of some file and the parts of another file and you know so is, we might have lost some inodes and this and that so essentially the entire data is lost okay so even if one disk is lost the entire data is lost effectively okay so there is and this this reliability is worse than a single disk because the probability of failure of any single disk like taken together, the probability of failure of any single disk is higher than the failure of a single disk itself. Okay, so uh, so what can we do about it? So obviously, you know, if you just care about speed and not about reliability, this is great. But if you do care about reliability, then we need to do better. Okay, so that's what that's what brings us to something called RAID one. Okay, and what do we do? Usually when we worry that, oh, we might lose a file, then we make a copy of it, make it we make a backup, right? So, so that's a very simple concept. So, so if we are worried about failure, then we should make a backup. And, and these levels that we are going back to our failure model, uh, you know, what kind of failure model, what are we trying to protect against? So here, uh, we're trying to protect against the failure of any single disk. Okay, so what that means is if any one disk in the disk array fails, then we should be able to recover from it and get the system back to its pristine, uh, uh, pristine, you know, situation. Okay, so uh, so, so the simplest solution is to keep a copy of each disk. So if we have disk zero, so we take half the number of disks in the disk array and designate them as backup, okay? So disk zero, we keep a mirror zero. So whatever, if we have block zero here, then there'll be a copy of block zero written to mirror zero. Similarly, block one will have a copy in mirror one, okay? Block two has a copy in mirror zero and block three has a copy in mirror one. So we are still wrapping around the data blocks, right? We still have four disks, but we use only half the disks as data disks and other half as mirror disks. And then we wrap the data logical IO blocks around the physical disks, so zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, okay? And for every write operation to, to say disk zero, you have to do a corresponding write operation to mirror zero. So if you're updating block two, you have to update mirror zero disk uh, as well okay or if you are updating block five then you have to update mirror one as well okay so uh, so this is a great so now if we look loose disk zero then we can just pause all the io operations make a copy of mirror zero into to uh, bring a new disk just plug it in and copy copy it over okay um so and and likewise you know and then once everything is all set we have recovered disk zero then we can start using the disk uh, using the disk array again so so it is important that we pause all the io operation once you detect a failure that a disk has failed you should stop all io activity till we recover disk zero because if we keep continue to do IO activities and in between another disk fails, then all our data may be lost. Okay, let's say that uh, mirror zero also fails. Disk zero failed and then mirror zero also fails in the meantime, then we can't recover from that. Okay, that's why 
what is our failure model? Our failure model is that we want to recover from all single disk failures. Okay, that's very important. There are two disk failures. You know, we could aim to recover from that, but right now that's not our goal. Okay, so you want to guarantee that if there's a single disk failure, we can recover from it and get back and uh, get back into the game. Okay. Um, any questions so far? All right, so let's um, continue. Now, uh, so this is, okay, so there's a question, great. Um, does read one require two disk writes every time or are there periodic backups? No, it, it, it yeah, so remember that this is uh, instantaneous backup. So RAID gives you the illusion, or not illusion, it gives you the guarantee of an instantaneous backup, right? So what that means is usually there is a, a disk controller sitting. Um, so going back to this figure here, like there's the file system, it issues an IRD. So usually there's a device driver that's sitting or a, or a RAID controller. You can implement RAID in software or hardware, but then hardware is more common because it's faster. And there'll be like a RAID controller device that pretends to be a single disk to the operating system, but then underneath, every time it gets an IO operation, it's gonna split it up and then send it across you know, two disks, two, 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 two different disks, primary disk and backup disk. So, uh, so yeah, and, that, and though both the writes have to be written to the disks, committed to the disk before you can, before the RAID controller can tell the OS that the IO operation is complete, okay? So, so unless both the writes are committed, you can't, report back to the OS that the IO operation is successful. So, so this is a hard requirement. So, so every write operation has to be immediately written to primary and backup. You can't, you can't like say, oh, I'm done and then report back later because in between that, if you do periodic backup in between, there may be another failure and, and then you would lose the guarantee. Is writing to disk and mirror an atomic operation? Another good question. Yes, it has to be an atomic operation, meaning that um, you, you have, if you write to the primary, you have to make sure that the write to the mirror is also successful. If any one of them fails, then the I operation uh, should be discarded. Okay. And that's part of what making them atomic is what makes the rate controller, designing a rate controller so complicated because you know, it's, you're know you taking multiple operations and make, guaranteeing that they will both happen or none will happen, right? So, so which means that the logic in the rate firmware has to, has to make sure this happens. But every I operation also, it happens fast enough Throughput is a big concern. Okay, any other questions? All right, so, um, so, so now if you notice though, you, you may say, well, wait, so we had just taken half of our disks and set them as backup. So aren't we wasting half of our disks? You know, like two of the disks are mirrors, right? So it turns out that it's not a complete waste because we have just labeled them disk zero and mirror zero, but in practice, there's really no difference. Like they have the same data, right? So if, if for example, I was re only doing read operations, I could read from disk zero, right? I could read block zero from disk zero and you know, uh, block one from disk one. And I could probably be reading block two from mirror zero and block five from mirror one. Yeah, and I could be reading four different blocks from four different disks. So I, for read throughput, I can actually get n times speed up, right? So if I have n disks, I can get n times the throughput of a single disk, 
which is pretty cool, right? So mirror disks are not completely sitting idle. Only when you're doing write operation, then both the primary disk and the mirror disk have to be engaged. So what that means is for write operations, I can only do two write operations in parallel, right? So if I'm writing to disk zero, it'll be, mirror zero will be engaged. If I'm writing to disk one, mirror one will be engaged. So I can still get n by two parallelism in write operations. So this is just not bad, actually. If you think about this, read one is you know, pretty decent. You know, it can give you n times speed up in read operations and n by two speed up in write operations, okay? Only bad thing is that, you know, half the capacity is used up for duplicate data. So it's not the most efficient use of storage space, but if you don't care about wasting this capacity, then this is a fairly decent solution, okay? And there's one more interesting thing about RAID 1, which is it can guarantee all failures from a single disk, okay? Which we have already discussed. So if, if any of the primary disks fail, you can copy from the mirror. If any of the mirror disks fail, you can copy from the primary, right? Uh, but then it can also recover from some two disk failures, okay? What that means is, let's say that you lose disk zero and you lose disk one, right? Now, I can recover from that, right? I have mirror zero and mirror one, so I just copy mirror zero to disk zero and mirror one to disk one, right? So I've recovered from a two disk failure. Uh, what I cannot recover from is if the uh, disk, the primary disk and its corresponding mirror both fail. Then I have completely lost the, the corresponding data. I can't recover from it, okay? So it can recover from many two disk failures. It can recover from all single disk failures, many two disk failures. So then it can you know, give you a pretty decent performance for read and write IO parallelism, okay? So people should be happy with this, but they weren't happy. They said, well, we don't want to waste half the space uh, just storing copies of data. So we want to make more efficient use of the data, uh, the space that we have, okay? So that's where the other RAID levels come in and they try to improve upon RAID 1. So, um, so in the original paper for RAID, they proposed this level called RAID 2 and uh, the, the reasoning behind RAID 2 is that in earlier disks, um, your certain disks blocks, certain data blocks could go bad, all right? And the uh, disk hardware was, or the firmware wasn't smart enough to detect when disk blocks went bad. So it couldn't tell you uh, when disk blocks went bad. So as a result, a lot of the error correction operations had to be done in software. And um, so you might have a disk in which part, some of the blocks are bad and some of them are not bad. And, and, um, and then you had to somehow recover from these failures where there's partial disk failure, okay? So if you have taken some course in say communications theory or signal processing, right? Um, then you might have come across this notion of error correction and error detection codes, okay? If you have taken a course in networks, for example, sometimes they talk about error correction, error detection code. And you can apply some of those principles in onto storage systems, which seems completely different, but basically we're dealing with information loss and recovery, right? So, uh, and the general idea there is that, uh, you know, in addition to data, you send some extra information that helps you detect and correct errors. So here, if we are storing, say, blocks zero, one, and two, right, then we can have some additional information stored, which is some kind of a function computed on these blocks, right, some kind of a checksum computed on these blocks. So, and, and with that checksum, so every time you, uh, let's say read, uh, uh, let's say you read one of the blocks, you then verify if the corresponding checksum matches. And if it doesn't match, then uh, there is something wrong, something went bad, okay? And you have to do a recovery operation. So, uh, and likewise, if you 
use if you have more bits or, or more space for this parity information the additional checksum information then you can do more complex things like you can not just detect that something is wrong but you can actually fix you can identify what data went bad and then you can fix it okay so there's an entire theory behind error correction and error detection codes we are not going to go into the, the details of that because uh, you know that's no longer necessary for modern disks and i'll tell you in a bit why okay so but the key idea was that by storing some extra information you can uh, de detect errors and you can correct errors in the read uh, in inside the read controller okay um, as time progressed the disk hardware became better at detecting bad blocks and and also correcting them meaning like they would remap those bad blocks uh, you know to some other location and, and internally recover from those so only time that the disks would completely fail would be when they were unrecoverable so when a disk fails it, uh, now it usually means that the data cannot be recovered it's like permanent detection there's no bad blocks i don't know if any of you have run software on old disks where you go around marking bad blocks right a disk health check you know we used to run this software it used to take a while and it would mark bad blocks and so on but these days nobody does that you know why because disks internally take care of all that stuff and you know when the disk completely fails then it just reports saying i can't handle i operations anymore so now either the whole disk fails or um, you know or it keeps working so you don't there's nothing in between there's nothing like a partially working disk okay so with that in mind we can kind of simplify uh, the rate subsystem to say what can how can we make this uh, mechanism more so what we're saying is that error detection is no longer the problem of the rate controller the disk firmware will report and detect and report an error when it happens all that the rate subsystem has to worry about is error correction once you detect that a disk has failed then how do you recover from it okay so the problem is reduced and as a result we can come up with simpler schemes uh, for error detect uh, for error correction okay uh, any questions so far all right so i'm going to just give a basic uh, you know primer uh, or some you know sneak view on how you will approach the solution and then i will leave it at that okay so we'll go back to our you know digital logic or digital design uh, basics and talk about we all know these basic logic operations like and or xor and so forth right so, so we're going to look at one particular uh, operation called xor and the way xor works is you know you're given two bits like say zero and zero if you zero xor zero then that's a zero all right if you zero and XOR one, then the result is a one. One XOR zero is a one and one XOR one is zero, okay? So if the bits are same, like zero XOR zero or one XOR one, then the result is zero, okay? If it is zero XOR one or one XOR zero, if the two bits are different, then the result is one, okay? And this is very simple uh, operation but it has some very interesting property of course it is associative and commutative what that means is that i could say take one of these bits to the other side and the equation will still hold for example uh, let's say i take this zero in the second line over to the other side and do one x or zero that's still one okay the equation still holds and you know or i take this one here to the other side zero x or one that is one all right so you can kind of uh, do this exercise yourself so it's associative it's also commutative commutative means that um, if i do um what can i say let me see if i can 
write things here. Okay, on this, I hope you guys can see this. So if I do, you know, zero, XOR one, XOR one. So I, I can, so I can do, you know, this is the associativity part. I can do this, which is the same as doing zero XOR one, XOR one, okay? And in either of the two cases, you will, uh, the result will be zero. Right? Does it make sense? Any questions on this? Okay, so if this is clear, then how is it useful for RAID? Well, it turns out in RAID, whenever we lose a piece of data, we want to recover that piece of data. So let's assume that you knew that one XOR something was zero, and now you lost that something, there was a lost bit. How do you know what is that lost bit? Well, take the one to the other side and XOR it with zero. So lost bit is equal to one XOR zero, which is equal to one, okay? So if you had computed the parity information, the XOR information or ahead of time, then you can recover the lost information when you need it. Okay, it doesn't matter which of the three bits you lose. If you lose one, then you can recover one by, you know, doing an XOR of the remaining two pieces of information. Okay, so it, and it can extend to any number of bits. So if you have one XOR lost bit XOR one equals zero, then the lost bit is one XOR one XOR zero, which is zero. Okay, so, so this is for a single bit and you can extend this property to an entire block, right? So if you lose a block of data, you can exhort two blocks of data. And which, what that means is you exhort the corresponding bits and then you get a parity block. Um, and then as long as you have the parity block, you can recover the lost data blocks, okay? So I'm gonna stop here since we're out of time.